Right, ladies and gentlemen, if you retake your respective seats. Thank you, Deputy Leader. Right, we reconvene and we move swiftly on to agenda item 10, the 2015-16 actual revenue and capital spending. Um, the floor is yours, Councillor Smith. Thank you very much, Mr Chairman. As I watched the clock tick to four o'clock, I was starting to psych myself up, knowing item 10 was just round the corner. And then we've had this 10 or 15 minute break, so I've got to psych myself up all again, and I'm not sure I can do it. But this is an important report. We know that as every year progresses, the savings targets that we have to achieve become harder to achieve and more risky. I'm delighted that this report shows the outturn for the last financial year has concluded so close to the budget, a mere 0.5% under the budget, and that's a budget of £500 million. So it's giving an underspend of £2.6 million. I want to pay tribute not only to Jeff Dobson and his staff in resource management, but actually to all the budget managers throughout this council because without their sterling efforts, we couldn't have put in such a good performance. And I hope councillors will recognise that and welcome this outturn. Um, some of you will be aware that uh, Councillor Martin and I, I have had a slight disagreement in the press about the level of reserves, and we may well wish to rehearse that, uh, those arguments again in a few minutes, but I would say to you that the reserves that we have are necessary, especially when we are looking at the year we are now in, where we're having to make another nearly £40 million worth of savings on our revenue budget. And they are, by their very nature, even more risky than previous years. And if we don't make uh, those savings at this time next year, that money will have had to come out of reserves. Uh, our total reserve, our free reserves, we can look at, and from the figures we give you here, uh, they're about £49 million. That is, of course, uh, I once again emphasise against a, a net budget of £500 million, a gross budget of about £850 million, uh, and they are very necessary, and they also, very crucially, give us a very assured and healthy cash flow. Uh, various uh, large amounts of expenditure will hit us at various times during the year, and if we didn't have that healthy cash flow, we would have to keep taking short-term borrowing. And even in the present low interest rate uh, conditions, I'm glad to say that we get about half of 1% on the money that we invest overnight or for short periods, but actually, even at the very best, if we were to take some short-term borrowing at the moment, it would cost us around 2% and probably a bit more than that. So there's a margin of 1.5% there, which, because of our cash flow uh, strength, we don't have to take. So I do commend all of these figures uh, to colleagues uh, and, and to the uh, members of the Council who are here today. I'm happy to answer questions, but I do know that uh, some of my Cabinet colleagues would like to amplify uh, a few points about the, the budgets for which they're responsible. Thank you, Councillor Smith. And I'd just like to add to this that um, for those of us who were here in October 2010 and saw the first of the comprehensive spending reviews and the savings targets that were proposed and have seen the subsequent spending reviews and now we're into a four-year settlement period and we have just had the Chancellor of the Exchequer saying that he essentially is abandoning his plans for fiscal neutrality by 2020. I think all of us have looked at the savings targets that have been proposed year on year with some trepidation, quite frankly. Um, but each year we ask more and more of our staff and each year they have delivered. As you say, this is becoming more difficult and there is no doubt that in the future simple efficiencies and finding new ways of working internally will not cut it and there will have to be changes. But for now, yet again, I find myself in a position either here or sitting in a different role thanking the staff 
for the hard work that this takes. It is extremely difficult what has been achieved here. I think somewhere down the line, because they have achieved it year on year, we have become, if you will, slightly blasé that they have achieved it, and I think that informs, frankly, some fairly reckless comments I've seen about reserves. But as I look across other councils, and I look at neighbouring councils, you realise how this is an immense struggle. And some councils, and no doubt different cabinet members, will talk about their particular department. But some departments not that far away from us struggle to the tune of tens of millions of pounds over spending every single year. So this is not easy what you see before you. It is not flippant. It is not just the thing that we always manage to do. I think all of us here recognise that it's all very well for us to sit in this chamber to set these, to debate budgets and set these budgets, but it is actually our staff who have to go out and, quite frankly, make some extremely difficult choices sometimes as to how you deliver this level of adherence to a budget, something in a lot of councils they cannot achieve. So I would just like to add my thanks to the staff for the tremendous hard work and I will ask the Chief Executive to make sure that message goes out to all staff that we really do appreciate the hard work and effort that they've put in and to some degree the Director of Resource Management as well. But we'll work that in somewhere in there as well. So, Right, open it up to the Cabinet. Councillor Hoffensberger. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Yes, you kind of stole my thunder a bit there, but I, I will continue anyway because I don't think it hurts to um, re-emphasise those points. Um, despite the significant saving shortfall um, on the health and social care integration and a deficit on customer charges income, ACS was still able to spend within its budget and record a 0.5% underspend. And this is due to a combination of hard work and good fortune. Hard work, because as the leader said, um, because of the continued efforts across ACS to spend within its reduced budgets, and especially within the Supported Lives and Connected Communities project, which, mit which mitigates demand and reduces spend, which for another year has resulted in a flat gross spend position on ACS's largest budget. And good fortune. Good fortune because the government allocated some of the Care Act funding to prepare for the funding reforms, which it then postponed without clawing back the funding, that said, we did take the deliberate and prudent decision not to reallocate the uncommitted funds once it became clear that the HASKI savings, health and social care integration savings, was not, were not going to be delivered in full and therefore actively managed, and, uh, managed the position to keep within the budget overall. So congratulations to the team. Well done for the work they're doing on, on this very difficult subject. Thank you for that. Any other members of the Cabinet? Councillor Hicks. Um, I realise my areas uh, really make up a small part of the budget, um, but I do think it's worth just touching, I'd just like to touch really on the waste uh, and how well we have done in Suffolk uh, setting up the Energy for Waste facility. Um, you'll see that the waste infrastructure underspend is by about 400,000, and when we look at waste, a lot of that is because actually the residents in Suffolk have been sending less waste to the Energy for Waste facility, uh, which is actually a good thing because we are recycling more, so less goods are going through the system. Um, we're also seeing less tonnage of garden waste show up at household waste recycling centres, again, because people are composting, doing things at home, and not driving them straight off to a household waste recycling centre. Um, so there is a good news story in waste that it's a combination of good policy, good management, and also the residents of Suffolk taking on board that there are other opportunities to uh, dispose of their waste. So all in all, a, a very good news story. Thank you, Councillor Hicks. Couldn't agree more. Any other member of the Cabinet? Councillor Jones. Um, I feel I ought to comment uh, in that... Um, CYP is there, which is very slightly over budget. Uh, but I think actually to put it into context, uh, we've obviously had outside recognition by offset of the work that we're doing uh, in children's services. And actually the comment that they made that um, through the Making Every Intervention Count program, we were making savings whilst improving services. Uh, and that, 
uh, and I'll join if, uh, other members in, um, uh, in congratulating and thanking the staff for their, their work on that. We have challenges in the, uh, now and in the future. Uh, our children in care uh, is, um, is an area where we will become under increasing pressure because like nationally, um, we are getting uh, more uh, teenagers coming into care. Uh, they, uh, they provide their own sp uh, specific challenges. Um, the changes that we made to the um, uh, fostering care allowances uh, last year should, ad should ad uh, help to address that. And we've also got um, uh, the, the challenges in the special education needs. So uh, whilst um, really thanking the staff, uh, I don't underestimate the challenges that we have um, meeting us in this year and in and subsequent years. And that counts the Jones is why we have reserves, isn't it? So that when we have facing difficult situations, we have the ability to step in and deal with those situations. Councillor Hudson. Thank you, Chairman. I guess all of us have seen that little uh, cup that says keep calm and carry on. And it, it sort of went over my head the first few hundred times that I saw it. But when we think about it now, keeping calm may be an aspiration, but the carrying on in the best way you can is, is a real challenge for us all. But I think it's one that this authority is doing its best with. I know we could, everyone says we could do better in some ways and we could do worse in others. But do you know what? I'm a, I don't know what it is. It's probably because of the sun shines out out there. I had to go out very quickly. But I think there's an air of optimism, and I wanted to put on record what other colleagues have done about the thanks that we owe to the staff, because keeping calm and carrying on is damn difficult, particularly when you're at the, 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 the pointed edge in education, as my colleague Councillor Jones has uh, gone on about now, particularly in ACS, the people expect the best they can. They know that the money is, money is not there as much as it should be, but I'm optimistic, Mr Chairman, that with the will that we're showing, and Councillor Smith takes his duties, as you know, extremely seriously, aided and abetted by senior officers, I'm optimistic that we are doing those tickets, we're, we're keeping well within our budget as far as we can, but I think better days are coming. I think we have to have that aspiration and hope as well in the background, because it's no good being too down in our dumps. We will get there. Thank you. I couldn't agree more, and I think the sense of measured optimism is in distinct contrast to some of the comments I hear from council leaders in other places in this country. They're struggling to contain their budgets, they're burning their reserves, which is, as we all know, a foolhardy approach to managing budgets, and they are beginning to worry about the future. And when I talk about Suffolk, I talk about our ability to live within our means, to manage our budgets here at the County Council, the work being done with our staff, and that we have those reserves to deal with those situations that occur. Councillor Storey. Um, well, I, I feel a bit um, overwhelmed now because I, I, everybody said what I was going to say. Um, you know, congratulations to everybody. I think the directors really do uh, pass the message down to say, you know, we've really got to do. Our, everybody has to do their bit. So, you know, that's that's tremendous news. The only, um, obviously, being new to the cabinet and with a, a new role, there's there's not much that I can pull out of the paper. But I did pull out from. Um, paragraph 41 about the super fast broadband project um, being completed on schedule it was on schedule it was uh, under budget and uh, and in fact it was delivered ahead of schedule so that is really good news we also have a take up of uh, something like 33% on super fast broadband whereas the actual original contract was based on 20% take up so we do have some some clawback um, from from that contract which we will be putting into uh, to getting 98% of premises in uh, Suffolk with uh, super fast coverage i know that there are areas where 
they they're not promised it for some time and obviously it's it is a commercial operation and um, and we're relying on open reach to provide that coverage but the um, you know we're going to get there and and we are so much ahead like like you were saying about the the um, the budget and and the way that we've managed uh, over the last well several years uh, I think that we are ahead on in terms of broadband as well and it's not something that's uh, that's generally recognized so uh, I just think that's a, a really good news story for everybody thank you councillor and I think we you know we have absolutely reaffirmed time after time that this is the fourth utility and as a county council we will do everything within our ability albeit that we are somewhat beholding to open reach we will do everything we possibly can to make sure that superfast broadband is delivered by 2020 to every single household and business within Suffolk. So, um, absolutely right. Councillor Finch. Like uh, Councillor Jones, I feel I, I need to say a little comment about exceeding budget on the highways sector. Um, and I think that was related to the... Um, the learning curves of working with an external contractor in the first two years. Um, we had a large number of unresolved invoices, um, and I'd like to pay tribute to the team for being very hard-nosed on those, because some of the claims they were asking for were far in excess of the claims we actually had settled, which were cumulative over since October 2013. Um, the other area, as is highlighted in the, in the, in the paper, was the delay, in terms of revenue, was the delay in the implementation of the LED program, which is now up and running. And I have to say is an, a very good example of a team that is now totally integrated across both the contractor and our team. Um, if I can just make reference to the other variants, which is, um, if you like, one can look upon it as a positive or a negative variance. The capital underspend, there's some very good I say there's very clear explanation of why that capital um, underspend is there, and that's related to two delayed projects, but, but one at Beckles uh, Relief Road and the other one being at Mort Morton Hall. Beckles is actually going, um, is about to um, have the, um, I've got a mental block, sorry. It's, it's the first the, sod term, is so, it? Well, yes, but there's all, there, was, there was a query that had to be satisfied before we could start. Yeah. Shocked faces across the air. So those are the two variances. One was a positive, one was a... I mean, I don't call underspend of capital a positive. I call it actually a, a delay in projects that we planned, which was out of our control. Any other Cabinet member? No? OK, so we will now open it up, and the first one... I've got, Councillor Brown. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I congratulate Councillor Finch on his use of his uh, crystal ball because he's comprehensively answered my question already. Thank you. Cheers. Excellent. That's the sort of question we like to see. Short, sharp, and answers itself. Marvellous. Um, Councillor Jacklin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, in paragraph 33 on page 52... It refers to a small overspend in the councillor's budget. Um, that's question one. I've got three questions. Is that okay, Mr. Chairman? That's a simple one, isn't it? One line, really. Right. I'm in paragraph 26, um, on page 51, it talks about the Suffolk Fire and Rescue Service, and uh, it refers to the underspend uh, and the, res uh, the revenue underspends, which are now going to be put into re reserves. Now, surely, surely this money should be spent on revenue and not put into capital. Uh, and uh, they, they talk about emergency vehicle renewals and, uh, and, and such like. Surely there's plenty of money in their reserves to pay for those, and they should come out of capital reserves. And... Finally, a sort of a general question addressed to all the Cabinet members. In general terms, if, if there's an early realisation that savings have already been made, do Cabinet members accept 
that further reductions in staff and services aren't any longer necessary. Um, you don't need to uh, cut uh, in anticipation. Do you think it necessary that this doesn't indicate that these savings are less fiscal than ideological? So we, the custom here is that the person who leads the paper is the person who answers the question unless they de defer to others, although I, I found your third question quite bizarre given the savings targets that are before us uh, over the next four or five years. I, I find the third part utterly bizarre, but no doubt Councillor Smith will be more than able to answer all of those and possibly with the occasional help from his friends. Councillor Smith. Well, I'll try. Um, there was indeed a small overspend in the councillor's budget. Uh, this was mainly due to travel uh, claims being slightly higher than budgeted and uh, slightly more special responsibility allowances uh, awarded uh, than again budgeted. But a very small amounts. And please believe me when I say that councillors are cheap. And we provide, all of us on both sides of the chamber, we provide very, very good value to this authority. So I think we can live with a small overspend. And I even include you, Councillor Jacklin, in that, giving good value to this authority. Now, I think that's good value, not cheap. I'm not sure any of us appreciate that one, but good value for money, I think, is the key there. Well, uh, you know, all right. Well, it's certainly good value, but we do come cheap. Now, uh, I will leave, if I may, uh, the answer to the Fire and Rescue Service question to my colleague, Councillor Hicks, but let me just finish uh, with your other um, remarks, a response to them. Uh, we have reduced our staff numbers over the last few years quite considerably, and I've always been very proud that we've done that at all levels. If people say to me, you're only taking out um, staff at the lower levels, we can prove very easily that that's not the case. We've taken out staff at all levels, including the very highest level. But of course, we do get to the stage where if we keep taking staff out, then the services will, the service delivery will suffer. And we don't want that to happen. We need our staff to be motivated and to provide good quality and good value in services to us. I don't rule out that we have stopped looking for efficiencies and new ways of doing things, because if we find more efficiencies and if we find different ways of doing things, it may mean that there will be further reductions in staff. But I honestly don't think those staff reductions in numbers will be great any longer. And our budgets are set realistically, not ideologically. We know what our targets are. We are just about to uh, enter a period when the way local government is funded will be fundamentally difficult, uh, f fund fundamentally different, and that transition will be a difficult one. There's no doubt of that. But we need to, uh, to, to be up to that challenge. Uh, and it's not an ideological um, response, it's a practical response that we have to make. Would you like to comment, Councillor yeah. Hicks? Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, if someone retires under normal circumstances, obviously the government funds the pension, uh, but if they uh, retire through ill health, uh, the Fire and Rescue Authority has to fund them for two to three years. So that's a substantial amount of money that has to be set aside every year. Uh, which is why that money, uh, which I'm very pleased to report, hasn't been drawn down by anyone needing to draw down that money, has been transferred into the reserves. New vehicles are funded from revenue in Suffolk Fire and Rescue Service, um, and with the IRMP now complete, um, there are uh, clear ways that that money will be spent. There is obviously a risk next year that someone could get injured, and we may run up a debt and have to go into the reserves further than money budgeted, um, but there is particularly areas of focus that have come through from the IRMP. Are we going to put the money into prevention and on-call availability during the day? Um, some of that, um, for example, we need a new fire experience vehicle that's used to go around schools educating young people. Um, that's coming to the end of its life, and that will come out from some of that money. 
Um, we'll also help go through the transition period. Uh, we, have we are at the moment trying to increase on-call availability, as you know. And in the short term, while we go through the changes, we are advertising for four 18-month fixed-term firefighter on-call contracts. Again, part of the day-to-day -day activity, and that will be to operate Monday to Friday. So rest assured, that money just won't sit in reserves. We will be using it. Um, and, but it, we, it comes out of an element of the fact that we haven't had any firefighters needing to call on that through ill health in, the, in that year. So that could always change from year to year. Uh, so, so let me get this right. We put 0.7 million into the reserves and we've cut the fire service budget by 0.7 million because that came out of the budget this year. So there's a total saving of £1.4 million. Um, surely we don't need to make the cuts that we need to cut if we've got all this money lying about doing that. If, if, if only it was that simple. Um, <laughs> if only It's not at all that simple, because as I've just explained, this is through ill health. And next year, we could have numerous firefighters who are actually, through ill health, call on that money. So next year we could run up, in fact, go the opposite way. So this year, because that money has come through and it's not guaranteed it will come through every year, we have the oppor opportunity to use it to the best advantage for the residents of Suffolk. The mentality is, Mr Chairman, that we keep putting more and more money into the reserves and if we do, we then find a reason. And it just seems to me it's obscene when we're cutting jobs and we're cutting services to the public in the fire service. Well, I'd have to come back and say quite the opposite. What we're doing is prudent financial management, and when there is some money left in the kitty, we're using it to the best advantage for the residents of Suffolk. Absolutely. Right, moving on. Councillor Lockington. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I was, I'm looking at page 54, the adult and community revenue budget, and I'm hoping Councillor Hoffenspur might be able to help me here. Um, I'm looking at the housing-related support, where the first was a environment of 100,000, and then there was an underspend, I think, of 400,000, as far as I can read the budget. That means that's half a million underspend. Within the housing-related support, um, I am sure you will have the supported housing people there, or the supported people budgets in that. I think we need to have a good look at it, because nowadays in for some sheltered accommodation, you have residents living there with far more mental health issues. And if you have a sheltered uh, block of uh, with 30-something residents, but you have three or four of them with really serious mental health illness. So much, so one resident will say, oh, I had to keep so-and-so talking. So the particular other resident weren't attacking the other residents. Now, that's not what you should live in a sheltered accommodation to have to do. And I really feel we need to look at whether we are giving enough support to supported housing and to people who live in sheltered accommodation. You should have a right to live in a safe environment once you are in there. And there should be a quick way where if something happened in shelter that actually they could go back to the county council and say, look, we've now got more people living here with higher needs, so we need more help to pay for the wardens and to pay for the support. Um, because I, I find it sad to see. Um, yes, it's wonderful to save money, but when you think that you have out of a budget of eight million actually saved half a million in a year, uh, you know, you actually think that, yes, we can sit here and be happy we've saved money, but what about the people? It does hurt out there with our residents, our elderly, our most vulnerable. They are hurting, they are scared, and we can't have that. Thank you, Councillor Lockerton. Um, firstly, if you do know of any instance where someone is being um, hurt, as you say, um, please do 
tell me about them because that certainly should not be happening in any environment, whoever they are, and, and I certainly wouldn't support that. Um, I must say that I haven't heard of any particular instance, but if, if there are, please do let me know. With regards to housing-related support, it's, it's wrapped around the individual, so whatever support they need, it would be the appropriate package would be built around that individual. Um, and if a, a, a certain um, sheltered accommodation um, supported housing scheme is appropriate for them, and then, then that would be what would be recommended, and there would be a care package wrapped around that person. Um, but as I said, I, I totally agree. We, we, um, we are absolutely committed to um, supporting the most vulnerable our community and elderly residents support where, wherever they are, whether it's in residential homes or wherever it's in... Um, supported housing um, that's absolutely our, our number one priority but if there are any incidents where they're not being supported adequately please do let me know because that's certainly not we're, what we're committed to Councillor Smith if I may also comment Chairman thank you it is definitely so uh, a fact now that uh, we are looking uh, and trying to understand in much greater detail than we have in the past the problems uh, of mental health. It's been a, a Cinderella service in so many, so many ways over so many years and it is now something which has come quite rightly to the top of the agenda and uh, so we're looking at how we deal with that and see how we can uh, factor some resources into that. I would only just say in the year that we're in now, uh, the ACS budget has gone up not down. We did not cut the ACS budget. We did not cut the CYP budget. Both of those went up in recognition that we are trying to target our resources to those who are most vulnerable. And I'm proud of that. A very good point. Well made, Councillor Smith. Councillor Barker. Thank you, uh, Chairman. Um, I've got four questions for Councillor Jones. The first one is a simple one, is uh, to do with the MEEC, the Making Every Intervention Count restructuring in April 2015. I just wondered how many, it says many of the vacancies have now been filled. I just wondered what the total number of vacancies is as of today. Uh, secondly, that's, that's on page, that's paragraph 20 on page 50. Paragraph 21, it mentions SEN placements. There's various concerns there. I just wondered if we could have a breakdown of the costs incurred by each point that's mentioned in paragraph 21 to see the proportion of spending on each one. Question 3 um, mentions, and this has, or was partly, discussed at education scrutiny. However, um, this relates to the greater number of children being taken into care, aged 12 plus. Whilst driving down from, from uh, last off today, the Children's Commissioner mentioned that they are, there's a project that she was interested in, which is reducing the number of young people going into foster care by joining up the specialist support for young people and their families and schools with backup mental health support as well. And I just wondered if we're looking at investment to save for young people, we should be looking at these kinds of projects because that figure is going up, not only in Suffolk but across the country. And a much bigger issue, we need to think, what is it in our society which is creating the conditions where young people aged 12 plus are increasingly being needed to be put into care because families and communities can't cope, which is a much bigger issue than, than in here, but what, what is it we're doing that's causing them to react in that way? Um, and question four, on page 55, it mentions support for unaccompanied asylum seekers in Suffolk. And I just wondered, is the government uh, keeping true to its promise about supporting with money uh, those young people who are very vulnerable and are here under the care of Suffolk. And I just wondered if, if the government is keeping to its promise on that. Councillor Jones. If I can respond to the four questions, and um, if, I, if I get anything wrong, uh, I'm sure uh, Alan Cadso sitting behind me will uh, correct me on that. Um, 
The, the first two, the meek and the special education needs, I don't have the um, figures to hand. Um, they might be somewhere in the back of my brain, but I, I can't retrieve them. Uh, so I will respond um, to you on, on, on that one. The, um, uh, the, the, the children and the, um, especially the 12 plus uh, coming into care, you're quite right. It, it is a problem which is national. Um, and, um, uh, and I take your point uh, about the mental health, and that's why we are, pu we, uh, we are putting more money into that. Uh, we are having, uh, we are doing work with the, with the health, um, and with the, um, with the families. I think that's um, uh, perhaps one of the reasons um, uh, why the leader um, has uh, um, made um, Councillor Robbie Miller as a member with special responsibilities for families. Uh, and that's, uh, that, that's very much addressing uh, that question. Uh, as I said to Councillor Burroughs um, uh, the other day, the, uh, the better the job that Councillor Miller does, the less uh, the children will be going into care, which is the whole uh, um, uh, point of it. Uh, the, the, f uh, the last one on the un unaccompanied children asylum seekers, uh, they, uh, the, we are getting funding um, for it. Uh, I think it's probably a new point whether it covers the, um, the covers the cost entirely. Uh, but we we have um, uh, stood up to the plate and taken the the, the, the number of children. Uh, some are still coming uh, in, but we, we we are meeting our, our moral obligations uh, to those children and to uh, fellow authorities. If I may just add to that, and uh, I agree with what Councillor Jones has said, uh, unaccompanied asylum seekers, are, as I understand it, yes, the government is giving us money, but of course in arrears, not in advance, so we need the cash flow there to help us uh, with that. And I agree with Councillor Jones, we're not convinced that it's necessarily going to cover all of the costs, and I think it may be for a two-year period as well. And uh, some of these young people may be with us for far more than two years. I'd also like to mention, if I may, uh, the looked after children that we're responsible for in this council, because over the years we have very, very, very hard tried to manage down the demand uh, uh, and the numbers, but uh, they are creeping up again for a whole variety of reasons, and that's yet another area which will cost us more money uh, and a, a possible budget overspend, which we might be looking at this time next year. Uh, and I'm going to make a point now, and I'm not remotely point scoring either. I'm just, in all seriousness, you know, when, when I talk to the leader of Kent and he talks about the problems that they've got of what is starting to arrive in Kent, we have made that commitment. We will step up. We will play our part in that. Uh, and there is no doubt that I think this budget is going to come under a lot of pressure in the future because uh, these are really serious issues that, that are going to take... Um, some general concerted effort across all the councils who are responsible for children um, because you just can't leave Kent on their own on this. They're, they've got to be dispersed and they've got to be looked after. And you've got some seriously traumatised children starting to arrive here. And we have made this point collectively through the LGA and through the CCN that actually two years, sorry, that, that doesn't cut it. Uh, and we already know with our own mental health services that there is pressure within that system. So this is a really serious issue that, that is going to hit us here. So, Okay, Councillor Gage. Thank you, Chair. Um, I've got three questions, if I may, to Councillor Finch and then one to um, Councillor Smith. Um, on page 52, under resource management um, section, We've got paragraphs 30 and 31. Can I just ask, um, Councillor Finch, um, the substantial overspend of 1.9 million, which was spent on dealing with claims um, and dis you know, disputed claims from, for highways works, can I ask, are all those claims now um, resolved or is there expected to be any further spending of that sort? Um, on, in paragraph 31, um, there'll be an underspend, I see there's an underspend in passenger transport, um, and it's as a result of a steady decline in passenger journeys. Um, can I ask then why this underspend? Sorry. 
He can multitask, can he? <laughs> um, <laughs> And occasionally do these things. Amazing. Probably not very well, but we, we give it a go. So okay. carry on, Captain. Um, so on, in paragraph 31, uh, the question I really want to ask is, um, can that underspend be um, spent to uh, reverse the steady decline in passenger journeys? Because it's clearly not what we want. Um, for example, maybe reinvested in the community transport contracts, such as um, not... Um, continuing the expected burden of reducing their budget. That's perhaps money which we can help them with to maintain the passenger numbers. And the third question was around um, the capital budget you referred to earlier, Councillor Finch. Um, is it right then that a third, of the, a third of the budget wasn't spent and that is totally attributed to Morton Hall and Beckles Relief Road? Um, and can I ask what we're going to do, because this, this happens year on year, underspend on capital. So can I ask what we're going to do to address that? Um, and then, if I may, to, um, to Richard. Um, you touched on um, how wonderful the sta staff have, have performed, and you're absolutely, absolutely right. I wouldn't disagree with that. But the reality is we've seen a significant reduction in staff numbers, um, and also we have a... a, a, a a policy of vacancy management, i.e. posts that we would like to see filled, left empty for some time, which puts additional burden on the existing staff to pick it up. Um, so given all of that, and the fact that we do have some contracts which are not performing very well, and I refer to, of course, as you'd expect me to, Keir, in that respect, can I not say to you then, Richard, is it not any wonder then that our services are underperforming, which is basically what a lot of this is about. This is about an underspend where we expect to spend a set amount of money and at the end of the year we have not. In almost all of them we have um, not spent all of the money and therefore, in my opinion, not delivered all of the services. Um, so how are we going to address that in the future? Councillor Finch and then Councillor Smith. But Councillor Smith, do not fall into the trap of receiving a set statement that's posed as a question for you to agree or disagree with. But never mind, Councillor Gage. Councillor Finch. Um, in terms of the disputes that we had, I can now say that um, everything has been settled by one um, issue up until March 16, which, and I, I give due credit to the officer team for working their way through that, which has been very complex. And um, so that's that particular answer. In terms of passenger transport, um, I think there is an opportunity for increasing the use of community transport, which is exactly what we've done in setting up the new Connecting Communities um, project. Um, and that will give the opportunity, because the whole scheme is much more coordinated, the left hand knows what they're doing across the various uh, participants and so to answer your question I think the um, the chances are that we will be getting a better service as a result of that community transport package um, so that's that one in terms of the capital budget I did actually say to that in my introductory notes they are they are primarily related to those two projects um, one is the um, the Beckles relief road and that was related to some legal issues which actually resulted in the delay in the spend of that. That project has now started and therefore it's not a saving, but it's just actually timing of that project. Um, and the second one is Morton Hall. Um, and that, that is now, I think, all the issues, if, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Mr. Dobson, but um, all the issues in terms of land ownership are now resolved and that road highway has now started. Uh, I'll come in if I may and just comment on that third question before I go on to my question. I, 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 uh, Councillor Finch is right in what he says. There have been specific problems assembling the land necessary for the Beckel South Relief Road. Uh, that has taken much longer than anticipated and has had to result in compulsory purchase orders, which is a last resort. Um, and equally, there have been uh, difficulties with... Uh, Morton Hall too. Unfortunately, and I don't say this with any pride, capital budgets always seem to lag behind where they, where they should. Um, it's almost a fact of life. I, I wish they didn't, but, but they do. But of course we've got some big capital budgets coming up some, uh, in, in the form of two bridges. 
one in Lowestoft and one in Ipswich. They're going to cost a lot of money. The government's giving £151 million towards them, but it looks like we're going to have to find about £40 million, which we haven't necessarily got in reserves for at the moment, so we shall, we shall have to work out how best we pay for those. Uh, and these are projects that, that come, up, come to us sometimes at relatively short notice, and, and we, we have to deal with them. Um, I would dispute that there is a policy of holding vacancies uh, to meet budgets. There is certainly no cross-council cross, um, policy. It is, I think, much uh, the decision of each of the policy uh, of the budget uh, holder, how they keep within budget, and sometimes they do hold vacancies. Uh, of course, it causes problems, and therefore, in the most sensitive areas, and I think of recruitment of social workers and so on, where well, we cannot allow that to happen, that doesn't occur very much. We'll use agency workers to, to, to cover there, which come at a higher cost. Uh, but in general, I would say we do not have that policy, but it is useful at some time in some areas of this council to ensure that budgets uh, are kept within. Councillor Finch, um, I did, in two of my questions, I asked specific questions which I don't think you answered, so can I come back to them, please? Um, on passenger transport, the question I asked was, given that we have a, a significant underspend, I think it's 0.7 um, of a million, the, my question to you was, why can't that be put into community transport? I understand all of you said that it's all singing or dancing, it's wonderful, but the reality is that year on year the budget, the bid in essence, I'm simplifying, but in essence. But what I did say, what, what is the truth, is that year on year the budget will be cut um, over the five-year contract. And the question I'm asking you is, given that there's been an underspend which you hadn't anticipated this year, why can't it be put into that contract such that the community transport providers do not have to find the shortfall that's going to come out of that contract? You don't have to force that um, cut in budget year on year in the contract. You could actually... Um, keep it at a level playing field. So that I would like a direct answer to that. And um, the other... The community transport proposal has been gone out to tender as a, as a business proposal which the tenders have actually bid for. They have, are running their business. They are running it with confidence that they will actually provide the service that we are doing. Throwing more money at them does not actually necessarily provide passengers. What they are doing is looking at their marketing and everything else, and I do not think it's... Having got a package, having got a tender, having agreed it on, in contract, um, they should be allowed to continue providing that... to, to, to develop that service and to develop the um, funding they require, which they have done and put together, um, that is the way we outsource, outsource services. And to go and just say, well, you've got some spare, would you like some more, is not the approach that we would take. If there is an issue whereby they are struggling and they would come to us to do, look for some specific funding because of A, B, C or D, then, of course, we would develop it. We certainly wouldn't just go and say, well, I've got some spare cash, would you like it? That is not the way that this administration works. And quite right too, Councillor Finch. Councillor Martin. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Yes, I mean, can I just come back very briefly on something that uh, Councillor Smith said about uh, social workers? Because if you look at paragraph 14, um, there is a £4.4 million underspend in the area social work budgets. That's in a ACS. In paragraph 22... There's an overspend on locums because of lack of experienced social workers in uh, children and young people. There doesn't seem to be any mechanism for uh, encouraging uh, the number of social workers that we need across the board. And I would suggest that actually a bit more investment in training and retention for social workers would actually save us money in the long run, as well as enabling us to give a better service. Uh, but that's... Uh, that's one thing. Um, I, I really wanted to talk about the, the, the basic shape of the whole paper and, and what we're being told here today. Um, 
Yeah, we're being told, of course, that it's a, a, an underspend of £2.6 million, but in fact, uh, against the budget book, uh, which is my concern here, because when uh, Councillor Smith has to set a budget, um, it is the budget that he sets that counts. Um, against the budget book, there is an underspend of £23 million. Um, and uh, it also, it mentions in, against the full year budget book from the budget book on table one, uh, an agreed use of £1.6 million to add to reserves. Now, I mean, I did actually talk to uh, the, um, the finance officer about this, and we couldn't find it. Um, given that that was two or three days ago, no doubt the finance officer had a chance to talk to Councillor Smith and found where it says in the budget book that the £1.6 million is. But I have brought my budget book with me for 2015-16, uh, so if Councillor Smith would like to tell me where it says that you are uh, um, agreeing to add £1.6 million to your reserves, uh, then I would be very much appreciating hear that, hearing that. This is not just a debating point, Chair, because um, here we have, uh, I have in front of me, uh, the Appendix B to the Cabinet paper for the uh, revenue budget for 2015-16. And on paragraph 28, it says, uh, this is in February of uh, 2015, it says the latest outturn forecast for 2014-15 is likely to be an overspend. Well, actually, no, it wasn't. It was an underspend of £2.3 million. It says, in 2013-14, the outturn was £1.6 million underspend. Yes, but no doubt it had originally been said that it was going to be an overspend. And to continue on, uh, the Cabinet paper Appendix B, the, exactly the same Appendix B, uh, for the budget for this financial year that we are now in. Of course, we will only know the outturn for that in, June, in July next year. Uh, it says, um, oh, I should have read the whole paragraph, really, shouldn't I? Because it's almost identical wording. It says, the latest outturn forecast for 2015-16 is likely to be an overspend of 0.7 million pounds. No, it won't. It won't, will it? I mean, we've actually added 14 million pounds to the overall reserves of this council between the outturn of 2014-15 and the outturn of 2015-16. You have a structural underspend in your budget. It is not about individual underspends on individual budgets. It is not about whether or not we've got a little bit more money in our reserves than we need to have this year rather than next year. The fact is, every single year, year after year, for the last eight years, you have underspent on your budget and you've added money to your reserves. And unless you come to grips with the fact that you have a structural underspend in your budget, you will continue to cut services more than they need to be cut. Chairman, what would we be facing if we had a structural overspend? We really would be in severe trouble. I don't accept that we have. We, 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 we set a series of figures and then plan deliberately to come underneath, and the figures we have in front of us show we have come almost bang on target. That may be £2.6 million difference. Well, I think I need to look into that, and we'll, we'll perhaps hear from Mr Dobson in a moment, because he hasn't talked to me about the £1.6 million figure of reserves that, uh, that you mentioned. But I think I come back to the very simple point that I've made earlier, that I am proud to be a member of the administration in this council, which has such a strong record of financial management. Um, uh, the, the first point you made was about social workers and investing in training and retention, and I believe that is going on, because we, we have had over the years problems of retaining social workers uh, for a whole variety of reasons, and there are a lot of initiatives in this council uh, to ensure that we do uh, keep social workers. But uh, as, as a general point, I'm proud with the budget that we have. Uh, it will certainly vary from the budget book, to the end of the year through a whole variety of reasons uh, which are forced upon us. Uh, but I wonder if Mr Dobson, could you just say something about this 1.6 million? 
Um, if I may say one or two points, really. Um, the the 1.6 million that's being referred to is the uh, full year budget book number um, on the left hand column. It says 499 million point one, and it's got agreed use of reserves of 1.6 million. Um, the question that was posed when we met Friday was where was that in the 15-16 budget book? Well, that 1.6 is an amalgam of reserves in and out, so it's a net figure. And also, those figures have been ta were taken off the numbers in the 15-16 column of the bu original budget book, so you came to a net. So in this paper here, we've sort of grossed them up to show that separately. And I've got the details here. I can share that with both of you uh, later. I think what I want to touch on is the structural piece, um, because um, we, I, I may well have said, uh, as you quoted, that we might have likely overspending, whether it was 14, 15, or 15, 16, or whatever. At that stage, uh, that was probably true on the forecast we had. And I would say, whether we did or we didn't, and clearly we underspent, the percentage over or under is still tiny in the context of the whole budget. So in terms of um, you know, bringing a tanker in, it's still very, very small margins, whether it had turned out to be over. As it turned out, it turned to be under, so we're on the right side. And the second point is we have actually got some structural overspends, which are being offset by some uh, one-off one savings. And I quote, uh, and it's quoted in the outturn, we've overspent on children, looked after children. Uh, that is a structural overspending which we are trying to manage down, have done for the last year or two, and we've managed to, if you like, offset that overspending by other savings in the, in the directorate. At some stage, those other savings won't be available, and that will show as an overspending. If we looked at adults and social care, you know, they again uh, would have overspent with the Haskey savings. Um, there was some fortuitous about the Care Act funding, some of that being retained. But in if that hadn't come about, then again, there would have been what I would call a structural overspending. So inherent in some of these numbers is some structural overspending, which at the moment we are managing through other savings mechanisms. But at some stage, that will come to an end and reserves will have to come into play. So I would just challenge you on the structural bit, because there are some structural overspendings in, in our budgets, and there's still massive demand and grant reductions going forward that we're going to have to deal with. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'd just add that, you know, it really is a hallmark of this, that here there is a... Our approach is about being prudent with the outlook that we've got before us, of continued reductions in our budgets for the foreseeable future. And on the other side, there just seems to be this very risky attitude towards the reserves, that just spend the reserves and hope tomorrow everything's going to come all right. And we will not go down that route. We will simply not take those sort of risks with the budget of Suffolk County Council. Moving on. Councillor Crosley. Thank you. I find it absolutely incredible sat here listening to criticisms and bollockings for people that have made an underspend on what is an absolutely huge, massive budget. And this is an old budget. It's 2015 to 2016, for Christ's sake. The actual results are only known now what it is. And to... You know, it's much better to have a marginal underspend than an overspend. And quite frankly, uh, the Director of Finance and Resources, or whatever you call him, he needs huge congratulations for having we achieved call him Jeff, but savings of £38.5 million. OK. The party behind us, of course, don't understand financial management. I do nitpick in terms of reserves when it comes to nitpicking for fire services and various other things. Eh? Anyway, I would like to refer to Councillor Lockington and what have you. I am concerned certainly about the focus on care of the elderly and I think far more attention needs to be paid to that. Um, I do have a lot of contacts in elderly care, 
and it is in a bad way. And I can tell you, um, and I have first-hand knowledge of a lot of the care homes now, the service is going down by and large to the care of the elderly because what the firms are doing, they're cutting the staff. So instead of, let's say, having eight on a night shift, they're now running with seven, seven or six. And I can give you plenty of examples of where that is happening. And that is the only way that they're currently managing their contracts is by cutting the staff. So I agree with Councillor Lockington on that. But full marks for the savings for actually achieving 38.3 in a financial year is incredible. Thank you. Councillor Smith. Uh, may I just come back and, and, and thank Councillor Crossley for his uh, kind words and an understanding of the problems that we face and the scale of those problems. And of course within that we are very much aware of the demographic pressures in Suffolk. We're aware of an ageing population and all that goes with that. And it's some people call it a time bomb, but I mean that time bomb is starting to go off now, let alone uh, what, the pr what the pressures will be and the extra costs that will come in in five or, or, or ten years. But uh, we, we do try and manage our budget carefully, prudently, and I'm proud of the way that, that we do it. In fact, my team, or the finance team, have been head down since the end of the year because they, they, they compile these end of year figures, they get everything ready for the auditors, the auditors are in now, uh, the accounts will be produced in September. This is all has to be done and next week we start planning for the 2017-18 budget. Councillor Crowley. And what are the savings required for next financial year? Do we know that? Yeah. Hang on a minute. This isn't a free-for-all. With, with, with doing this. So, Councillor Smith, I think you were asked a question about the level of savings we are aiming for next year. I think we all re recognise the changes that have taken place in the national government. Um, I think last week Greg Clark uh, was arguing that if, if we sign the four-year deal, he will do all he can to protect our budgets. But I think we're all realists, and I think we all accept that the government has to look at those budgets and may wish to review it in the autumn. Hence why we have reserves, so we can weather these very difficult times. Councillor Sylvester. Thank you, Chair. Just briefly to remind my fellow councillors that UKIP councillors should declare an interest <laughs> where care in the community is concerned. <laughs> You said it, not I. <laughs> right. <laughs> Thank you, Reg. <laughs> Having this meeting. And then, right, right. Any other councillors wish to say anything? Okay. Right. So we will return to the what we've been asked to decide, which is on page 47, and it is one little a, little b, little c, and little d. Can I take that to the vote? All those in favour? Thank you very much indeed. Excellent. We move swiftly on to agenda item 11, which is Ipswich Park and Ride. Councillor Finch, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, this particular paper, Mr Chairman, I don't bring with pleasure, um, because, as you know, we considered the future of the Park and Ride at our meeting in June. Having said that, I fully recognise the deliberations of Scrutiny Committee and the background to why this is here at this point in time. Um, the background to the paper we described in, we talked about, we presented in June 14, uh, sorry, the 14th of June, the paper described the proposal to change from a contract for services to the operation of commercial routes. And this would retain a park and ride service whilst saving the taxpayer over £700,000, which is very relevant, I think, Mr Chairman, to the discussions we've just had and we're going to be facing in the future. As a Cabinet, we agreed the principles of the new operating model and delegated authority to the Director of Resource Management to complete the negotiation and finalise these arrangements. However, the decision was called into scrutiny and it was made clear in the scrutiny the points for which it was uh, called in. 
the need for due consultation if the closure of the park and ride was to be considered, the relevance of correspondence from key stakeholders, the clarification around the delegation of decision-making, I'm paraphrasing, Mr. Chairman, and the assessment of the cost and financial benefits of the options. Mr. Chairman, following the debate, Scrutiny Committee referred the item back to today's Cabinet as detailed in the papers. In response to the above points, I have included the relevant correspondence in today's Cabinet papers, and I have redrafted the recommendations to make it crystal clear in terms of the specific concerns that um, the call-in and the scrutiny um, endorsed. By making, referring to these points, we don't want the new service to be set up to fail. We need a fast and frequent buses, so through the recommendations, we have committed to preparing a written agreement, a service agreement, with the new service operators, which will include a clear timeline for agreed infrastructure improvements. It is only once we have that agreement in place will we serve notice on the existing contract. It is anticipated that the final draft of that service level agreement will be available um, by the end of July. That's a final draft of that service agreement. We have also made it explicit, Mr. Chairman, that if for any reason no viable alternative provision for park and ride services can be provided, then we will agree to a consultation and a further report to Cabinet prior to the cessation or the ending of the park and ride service. And as I said in the last Cabinet paper, it is never and will not the intention of closing the park and ride service. It was a principal paper we put forward to you, and we were looking at creative ways of actually trying to retain the service and actually reduce the cost to this council. Other than the further clarity that the recommendations bring, I don't actually intend to bring any changes to this Cabinet. I think it's um, important to point out that this actually is a very good news story. This is actually challenging the logic of how we provide a service. It challenges the logic on the basis that that service, if provided in a different way, can significantly save money to the, the, um, the taxpayer, but it could also create a service which, will, which is actually an improved service by the, the working and collaborating with the stakeholders, in other words, the bus companies. So to conclude, Mr. Chairman, I believe the park and ride is a valuable service, and I think this administration wants to keep it. It is important for Ipswich, and it's important for Suffolk. And I would like you to agree that the, recommend, the re revised recommendations are before you. We can continue with this product, project and enable the service changes to be made, hopefully in early 17. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Fix. Councillor Hicks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I concur. Uh, this is absolutely a good news story. When you look at what we're being asked to approve, um, we're asked to approve the principles of the new operating model for the Ipswich Park and Ride bus service as laid out on paragraph 25. When I go through paragraph 25, I see nothing but a good news story. The bus service will no longer be managed through direct contract funded by Suffolk County Council, but will be a commercial service. Fantastic news. The cost of the passengers catching a bus would be unchanged. Again, good news. The car parking service will be free for customers using the park and ride bus service. Again, good news. Neither bus operator will require a subsidy from the taxpayer. Well, that is the ultimate in an efficient system and something we should be proud of that Councillor Finch and the staff have achieved that, which has taken a lot of work by a lot of members and officers. So when you go through the principles laid out on paragraph 25, it is nothing but consistently good news, which is not only reducing the subsidies that we have had to provide in the past, it is giving residents a much better service and a service that is economic to run. So 
one after another, points of, of good news that we should welcome. Um, as far as the changes go, and that, that's been put forward in the recommendation, um, I can see why they've come forward. Um, I'm happy to take them on board. Um, I'm happy that if there is no vi viable alternative, that it does come back um, to Cabinet prior to the cesa cessation of the current service. To me, that is quite a logical process, and I'm more than happy to support that. And again, the, the addition of the, um, regarding the memorandum of understanding that's been put into the uh, recommendation, again, I can see why that's come forward, um, and I'm happy to support that. But, you know, this is, this is a, a, a story that, in my view, has not been taken on board for what is ultimately an excellent news story for Ipswich and the people that use the park and ride service. So I really do say to Councillor Finch, well done for bringing this paper forward, uh, and I'm absolutely 100% behind supporting this good news story. Quite agree. Any other members of the Cabinet? Could... Councillor Finch, can you un answer something for me? Um, because obviously, um, notwithstanding the scrutiny, some of this seems to hinge around um, letters and emails we seem to have received. And I, I'm a bit perplexed by one or two of the things I read. So I, I've got an email here from um, Councillor Ellesmere of Ipswich Borough Council that says here, for the voice of doubt, if the infrastructure improvements are not put in place first, in their entirety. So this is referring to the 34 points that are going to be looked at as part of this. If they're not input in, in their entirety, so you just do every single thing, uncosted, unplanned, unassessed as to whether or not it does actually improve anything, then we are opposed to the changes. It, is that what is being said by Ipswich Borough Council, that they want every single one of these 34 points done before we even consider it? Because... I know what my opinion of that is. Councillor Finch. Thank you, Mr Chairman. The background to what you have just said is the exact reason why I felt that it was not appropriate to put some of those letters into the, um, the Cabinet uh, paper in, on the 14th of June. Because those 34 suggestions were suggestions, they had not been analysed, and we did not know at that time whether, in fact, they would or would not provide a benefit to the speed of the bus coming from the park and ride parking into the centre of town. Some of them, on analysis, do provide those, those benefits, but the majority actually provide benefits which are independent of the park and ride service. So the reason I didn't present that to Cabinet last year, last, last year, last month, um, was very clearly that I felt that would be misleading to Cabinet, and that was my logic. So I, like you, um, am concerned that actually 34 ideas just presented without being looked at in terms of their implementation to be done in entirety um, before any change of surface would be able to take place was an unacceptable proposal, which is why I didn't include it in the Cabinet paper. And as I understand it, you will look at these things. So these, we are being looked at, they are being looked at. Let but me the just... principle that we have agreed in the previous meeting that we're discussing today is that we are moving forward, but we will look at these things. Is that right? We are looking at them all, and the plan is one of the officers will walk through with um, Jeremy Cooper, the managing director of Institute Bridge, and identify specifically. Some of them will be quite, quite quick to implement. But we know others actually are impossible to implement. So there is a challenge. And what I'm saying is they need to be taken step by step. And what we will do is include those proposals in a memorandum of understanding or a service agreement with the contractors so that they will be included and we will commit to those we can do in, with their agreement. And if they, can, um, if they wish to continue the service with their agreement, we will do that. And, and then we will work on the others. And am I also right in thinking, having read this email three or four times, I can't see where Ipswich Borough Council, through, uh, through Councillor Ellesmere, is suggesting that they're prepared to commit any capital to doing any of these 34 that, if not implemented in entirety. So they're not actually offering to help in any way, shape or form. Have I got that right? That's my understanding. Just so I'm clear, I just thank you very much indeed. So Smith. 
Chairman, I was going to raise the point that you've raised this very important sentence, which is in bold type in uh, Councillor Ellesmere's uh, email. Now, I have been persuaded to follow Councillor Fincher's line because my line would be a little harder than this. We are subsidising this service by £700,000 each year. That's quite a substantial amount of money. There are arguments that we could use that subsidy if we removed it. We could use it better elsewhere. I'm prepared to hold my views at the moment and to see if the innovative ideas which have come forward to save this park and ride scheme can be implemented. But if they can't, and if Ipswich Borough Council are going to get in the way of helping us to save this scheme, then we may face a difficult decision. Again, I quite agree. The whole point of what we decide here is where this council spends its money. And when Councillor Lockington is talking about care packages, these are the areas that we are having to balance and we are having to judge. And we agreed some time ago that 700,000 supporting park and ride was not appropriate. We put it to our team and our team has gone out and delivered a solution that means we save the money and we continue with park and ride. I do not know of a more definition of a good news story than any I've ever heard. Any other member of the Cabinet? Thank you. I'll open it up to the floor. Anybody wish to speak? Councillor Crosley. Well, I suppose reinstatement of the Norwich Road, Barry Road, Park and Ride is probably not a good idea at this stage, but if your good news story turns out to be more than good news, and it does work out, then I would ask for somebody to look at reinstatement of that, providing it's not being subsidised to the tune of £700 million a year, of course. At, at £700 million, it would be an absolute no-brainer. <laughs> 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 Councillor uh, Evans. Thank you. I just wanted to thank Councillor Finch for taking on board the recommendations from the scrutiny calling. Indeed. Thank you. Any other councillors wishing to speak on this item? No? Okay. So we will move to the vote. And what is before us is to effectively is asked to reconsider, to approve the revised recommendations. So this is on page 68. Point five six A B C and D. All those in favour, please vote. We are unanimous of those present. Thank you very much indeed. Is there any other business? This is where you say no other business. Yeah. I haven't no been other. advised of any other business. On that basis, I declare the meeting closed. Thank you all very much indeed.